Hey everybody, Carl Schuf here from Greensock, and in part two of Revolutionize Your Animation Workflow, I'm going to walk you step by step through building a complex animation using the modular techniques discussed in part one. If you missed part one where I show you the many benefits of nested timelines, be sure to watch it now. Today I'm going to be using this demo to illustrate how we can take a wall of code like this and break it apart into modular chunks that are easy to read, edit, and control. Before I get into describing how all this JavaScript is now set up, let me walk you through how the DOM is structured. I'm going to comment out all this code here so that we can see this page rendered in its sort of pre-animated state. I'm going to then select this panel here and we'll just inspect it using DevTools. I want to point out that we have this parent element called banner and inside we have three panels, panel one, panel two, and panel three. Each panel is set up in exactly the same way, so let me just show you panel one. You'll see there's a div with a class of BG, and that's basically that colored rectangle that animates into view. And then we have a div with text, and you'll see that each piece of text is wrapped in a span tag here. If you're a Club Greensock member, split text can do that for you. And lastly, there's an image at the bottom. So all three panels contain the same elements. And next we're going to explore how the animation code is set up. So I'm just gonna focus on the code that we have for panel one. So I'm gonna comment out everything for panel two and panel three because it's very repetitive. This animation starts out with the background element scaling and rotating in with different durations. So I wanna point out that this selector here is selecting the BG element inside of panel one. After that element spins and scales in, we're then going to do a staggered animation on all the text. Again, you're gonna see that we're looking inside of panel one for a text element and then all the span elements. We're then going to add a label one second later so we have a little bit of time to read that text and then everything is going to go away. So the next tween is going to be a staggered tween on that text that fades it out and moves it down. Lastly, we take that background element again and we're going to scale it out and rotate it out. So you'll see that this rectangle scales and fades in, the text animates in, there's a pause, and everything goes away. And that's all handled in about five lines of code. Now, moving on down the line here, you're gonna notice that there's a lot of repetition and the only thing that really changes is the parent element inside these selectors. So everything in panel two just starts with the panel two class. Everything in panel three starts with the panel three class. And how we're using these selectors is going to be very important when we go to refactor this code. Now, although this code is a little bit repetitive and hard to read, there are some great benefits to using timelines. We went over these benefits in part one of this series, but let me just do a quick little recap. First, let me just get rid of this trailing comment tag here. So let's say I want to focus on panel three and jump to where the in three label is. I can just do something like this, tl.play in three. So when I run this the next time, you'll see that we jump right to where panel three comes in and I skip all the animation for panel one and panel two. That can be a huge time saver. If I want this animation to do something like play three times as fast and repeat twice, no problem. I can just uncomment this little line here, hit run, and you're gonna see that I'm changing the time scale and this animation is gonna repeat twice after it plays the first time through. We've got a ton of control over this animation because it's all in one timeline. However, if I want to do something like change the order in which these panels animate, I gotta do some pretty surgical copy and paste. I gotta copy a whole bunch of code like this, cut it out, and then figure out exactly where it's supposed to go if I want panel three to come in before panel two, and stuff like that can get pretty messy. If I want one section to maybe play a little faster or slower than the others, not really easy to do this way. And if I wanna make any sort of changes to the animation globally, like suppose I want the text to fly in from the right instead of from the top, I'd have to make those types of changes in three different places. I'm going to solve these problems by nesting timelines and using functions to create timelines. The first part about nesting timelines, I'm gonna handle by breaking this animation up into three separate timelines, one for each panel. So this existing TL that I have here, I'm gonna name that panel one, and I'm gonna add all these tweens to panel one, like so. I'm gonna do the same thing for panel two. So I'm just gonna find where panel two starts, and I'm gonna create a new timeline for panel two, and add the tweens to panel two as well. You can do the same thing for panel three. And let me just clean up by putting a semicolon at the end of the panel three timeline max, and the end of the panel one timeline. The next time I run, you're gonna see that all three timelines play at the same time. It's pretty cool, but not exactly what we want. 
So now that I have three individual timelines, the next step is to add them all to a parent timeline. So I'm going to go to the bottom of my code here, give us some breathing room, and I'm going to create a master timeline like so. In order to get my individual timelines into the master, I'm going to use master.add. Add is a very powerful method in that it allows you to add tweens, timelines, callbacks, or labels to a timeline anywhere you want. Right now, I'm just going to add the panel one timeline to my master. And I'm going to method chain the adding of panel two and panel three. Now when I run this timeline, you're going to see we're back to where we were before with all three animations playing in succession. Panel two comes in, and when it's gone, panel three will come in. And if somebody asks me to change the order of the panels animating, I just have to select a line of code in my master timeline and put it somewhere else instead of moving five or six lines of code around. And now that my timelines are all separate pieces, I can do some pretty special stuff to them when I add them to my timeline. So suppose somebody says, hey, you know what, let's really study panel three. I want to watch it play in slow motion a few times. Well, when I add it, I can just tack on a time scale of, say, 0 0.5, and I'm going to do a dot repeat of three times. And I'm going to add it at a label of panel three. Now that I've done all that, all I have to do is a master dot play panel three. When I run this code now, I'm going to skip by everything in the beginning, and we're going to watch panel three's animation play four times at half speed. So it gives us as animators a great amount of control over jumping around our timeline and tweaking things as they're added. But we still have a lot of repetitive code here that makes editing a bit arduous. As you know, functions are great for doing repetitive tasks. So next I'm going to show you how we can use functions to create these timelines for us. So the first thing I'm going to do is some code cleanup. I'm going to get rid of all the code except for the panel one animation. I'm going to take that panel one timeline and I'm going to wrap it in a function called create panel. Let me grab the timeline, we'll cut it, paste it in here. I'm going to give this timeline a more generic name like TL because this function is going to be used to create animations for many different panels. So now I have a neat function that creates a timeline. In order to see it work, I'm going to have to call that function. So I'm going to do create panel and then let me run. Awesome, it works. So now that I can animate one panel, I have to parameterize this function so that it can animate any panel. So I'm going to set up my function to accept a panel parameter, and then I'm going to use that value in all of my selectors. Let me just copy this out, and I'm going to paste it into each line of code. And then the next time I call this function, I want to make sure that I pass in a selector like dot panel one. When I run, hopefully this works. There we go. I just created an animation for panel one. The real beauty comes here. I can copy this function two times and I can create an animation for panel two and for panel three. And when I run, you're gonna see now that all three panels animate by calling one function with different parameters. Awesome. Now the next little challenge we need to talk about is controlling and nesting function generated timelines. And what I mean by that is that these timelines that I'm creating they're all being created inside of this function, and it makes it difficult to control them after they've been created. So for instance, if I want to change the time scale of the timeline that create panel generates when I pass in panel one as the selector, I can't do something like tl.timescale2. If I run this, you're not gonna see any difference in the animation, it's not gonna play any differently. And if we look into my console, we're gonna see that tl is not defined, okay? Well, it's not defined because it's scoped to this function right here, and I can't access TL outside of that function. So the trick here is that we're going to make sure that our functions return timelines so that we can reference them later, all right? And to do that, I'm just going to add a return statement to my function, return TL. And then when I create my panels, I can create variable references. I can say something like animation equals whatever create panel returns when I pass in this selector. Once I've done that, I can then reference that animation like so, and I can say dot time scale, we'll make it four so that it's obvious. And the next time I run, you're going to see that that animation runs four times fast. Cool. So now that I can create a timeline, return it, 
and then reference it, now I can work on putting those timelines inside of a master timeline. So let me get rid of all this. And like we saw with the nested timelines examples before, I'm just gonna create another master timeline. And then I'm going to use add to add the timeline that create panel returns when I pass in the selector of panel one. And I'm going to do that for panel two and panel three. And now when I run, you're gonna see that each panel's animation is going to play in direct succession. So I have one little function here that creates timelines and returns them so that I can add them wherever I want into a master timeline. Now that I have this core functionality in place, I'm gonna show you how we can parameterize this function just a little bit further. So I'm gonna make this function more flexible by adding a parameter that's going to let us control the direction from which the text animates in from. You'll notice here that we've hard-coded in this Y value of negative 50 for this animation on the text. So what I'm going to do is pass in a parameter, and I'm gonna name it start Y, and then I'm going to reference that value right here. Whenever I call the create panel function, I'm going to then also pass in a value. So for the first animation, I'll just say positive 50. For the second one, I'm gonna say negative 50. And for the third, we'll go back to 50. So now when I run this animation, you're gonna see that the first text comes in from the bottom. And then on the second panel, the text is going to come in from the top. And then on the third, you're gonna see it's gonna come in from the bottom. So hopefully you can see now that this approach really allows us to create code that is super modular, concise, and flexible. Now, obviously this example here was a little bit simplistic and all the panels basically animated in the same way. But this technique can be used for much more complicated sequences. Let's take a look at the Greensock homepage animation, and you're gonna see that it's built in the entirely same way. There's a function here called YGSAP. It creates a timeline, it does a bunch of stuff, and then it returns the timeline. There's a performance function that also creates a timeline and then is going to return it. As I scroll on down, you're going to see that the master timeline is built in the exact same way I was just doing. So let me just scroll down a little bit here, and we're going to see that we have this section that's going to say master.add whatever timeline the YGSAP function returns, and the same thing for performance compatibility and transforms. So even though this animation has literally hundreds of lines of code, I can easily find the transforms animation by just scrolling up to the transforms function. I can put these timelines together in any order that I want. I can change it around with ease. For ultimate control of your Greensock animations, I'm really excited to show you an early version of GS DevTools, which is available to Club Greensock members. GS DevTools provides you with a timeline controller that allows you to easily navigate and inspect any part of your animation. The first step to enabling GS DevTools is to make sure you're loading the GS DevTools JavaScript file. Here, I'm using a special version of GS DevTools that anyone can use on CodePen. Once you have GS DevTools loaded, all you have to do is type in gsdevtools.create. So the next time I run this demo, you're gonna see that I have this really cool control bar at the bottom of my screen. I can take this playhead and just scrub through at my own rate. If there's a certain section I'm interested in, I can do things like set custom in and out points. So for this animate anything text that animates in, I'll set my custom in point. I'll take the end marker and bring it right about there. I can scrub through that section however I like. I can even choose to speed it up and even loop it. So now I can just focus on that part of the animation. Now, one of my favorite parts about GS DevTools is the ability to be able to jump to any part of the animation with an ID. Check out this menu on the left here. I can select any animation that has an ID. So I'm gonna choose Animate Anything, and then now you'll see that the Animate Anything timeline plays through all the way, and it gives me an awesome and easy way to just jump to any part of my animation. And you may be asking, well, what's an animation with an ID? Let me just scroll through my code and I wanna show you that every time we're creating animations inside of these functions, I'm giving the timelines an ID. So here we have new standard. Scrolling on up the list, you're going to see that we have another timeline that's going to have the ID of control. The next function I'm looking for is the animate anything function that creates a timeline with an ID of animate anything. So let's just say that I'm interested in just that scrambling text animation, okay? What I can do is find the tween with the scramble text animation and give it its own ID. So I can get super granular in what I'm going to be inspecting. I'm just gonna type in ID 
colon, and I'll just call it scramble. Now the next time I run this demo, the same control bar is gonna open up, and we're gonna see that we have this menu here that now has a scramble option. And now I jump to just the animation of that text scrambling. I can scrub through it, loop it, change the speed, anything I want. Now you might be saying, well, why do you have to go to the menu every time? Exactly. So GS Dev Tools is highly configurable. So if I just want to inspect this animation many times and make changes and always go exactly back to it, what I can do is this, is when I call the create method, I can pass in some configuration options. So here I'm gonna do animation scramble. And now the next time I'm going to run this, watch what happens. We jump right to the scramble animation and that's the only thing we need to focus on. So what I've done here is I've selected one tween out of about a hundred and I've jumped right to it and I have full control over it now. It doesn't matter that it's nested inside of a timeline that's nested inside of another timeline. GS Dev Tools can find it and let you inspect it. The last option I want to show you is that sometimes you may not want all the bells and whistles of GS Dev Tools. If I set minimal to true, the next time I run, you're going to see that the controller looks just a little bit different. You'll see that we've stripped the UI down to the bare minimum, and we have a controller now that you can use for any animation anywhere you like. GS Dev Tools can be embedded inside of any div that you specify, and you can even use multiple instances of GS Dev Tools on one page. I can't cover all the features and configuration options of GS Dev Tools right now, but just be sure to head on over to greensock.com slash GS Dev Tools for more information. Before I go, I just want to review all the benefits of using functions to return timelines. First of all, it makes your code much more readable and concise. By grouping code into functions, it's easier to find those functions and concentrate on the code at hand. Creating your timelines with functions will also make it more flexible as you can add multiple parameters to add variants to each animation. It's also much easier to change the order of animations inside of a larger sequence. And overall, you just have a much greater level of control, especially if you start developing with GS Dev Tools. I strongly encourage you to try your hand at building some animations using functions to return timelines to a master timeline. I'm confident you will fall in love with this workflow and never go back to the dreaded wall of code.